Hello and welcome to another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 7, Lesson 12 on Geometric Means. Now you've thought a lot about means in past courses, but this will probably be the first time you've ever heard of what we call geometric means. So let's jump right into it and introduce this topic. Geometric means. Now when we calculate what's called the arithmetic mean of two numbers, and in the past you've probably always just called that the mean, we do so by adding the two numbers together and dividing by two. This results in a number that is halfway between the two being averaged. And let me take it a little bit further than that, right? It really gives you a number that when you add it to itself, right, gives you the sum of the two numbers that you're averaging, right? But there are many other types of means in mathematics and in science. The one that we're going to look at in today's lesson is known as the geometric mean. So let's bring that up to the top and formally define what a geometric mean is. The geometric mean of two numbers. If m and n are two positive numbers, then their geometric mean is given by the square root of m times n. All right, great. Now you can definitely find geometric means of three numbers, four numbers, five numbers. In all of those, you would be multiplying the numbers together and then taking the cubed root or the fourth root or the fifth root or whatever you know, root is appropriate. We're only gonna be working with the geometric mean of two numbers, not of anything more. So really simple, right? To find the geometric mean of two numbers, we find their product, we take the square root, and that's our answer. So let's take a look at exercise number one. Find the geometric mean of each set of numbers given. If the answer is not an integer, then write the geometric mean in simplest radical form. All right, well again, it's a simple idea, right? The geometric mean of two and eight is gonna be simply the square root of two times eight, which is the square root of 16, which is equal to four, right? That's it, it's equal to four. Right? Pause the video really quickly and find the geometric mean of 4 and 9. All right, great. Let me make this multiplication a little bit clearer here. So the geometric mean of 4 and 9 will be the square root of 4 times 9, which is the square root of 36, which is equal to 6. All right, simple enough. Now our answers for letter C and D are gonna be a bit messier, all right? Because when we find the product of five and 10, or six and nine, we're not gonna get a nice perfect square. So let's review this whole simplest radical form as we find the geometric mean of the numbers five and 10. Here we go, right? So the geometric mean of five and 10 will be the square root of five times 10, which will be the square root of 50. Now keep in mind, when we simplify the square root of 50, we're looking for the largest perfect square that goes into 50, which is 25 times two. And then of course we can find the square root of 25, which is five, and we leave the square root of two. So the geometric mean of five and 10 is five times the square root of two. Why don't you go ahead now and find the geometric mean of six and nine? All right, easy enough, right? So the geometric mean of six and nine is going to be the square root of six times nine, which is the square root of 54. And as we simplify that, that's gonna be the square root of nine times the square root of six, which is three times root six. All right, and that's it, okay? So the Actually, finding a geometric mean is very, very easy, all right? Um, but let's talk a little bit now in the next exercise about what it's really finding for us. Let's take a look at the next one. Now, geometric means get their name from geometry because they arise in many contexts within this particular branch of mathematics. Let's take a look at exercise number two. What is the side length of a square that has the same area as a rectangle with a width of nine feet and a length of 16 feet. Show how you arrived at your answer. Draw diagrams to support your work. All right, right, so simple enough. I'd like you to pause the video right now and see if you can figure out what the answer to this is. All right, let's take a look. So 
First things first, let's take a look at what we have, right? We've got this rectangle that's got dimensions of nine feet and 16 feet. And then we've got a square that has the same area, right? It has the same space inside of it. And what I wanna do is I wanna know the side length of this square so it has the same area as this rectangle. Might as well call it X, right? I'll call this X and X. And of course, this thing has an area of X squared. This one has an area of nine times 16, which is 90 plus 54 or 144 square feet, right? So that particular rectangle has an area of 144 square feet. So if I wanna know what the side length of this square is, I'm going to set X squared equal to 144, and x will be the square root of 144, or 12. All right, now before we move on, let's kind of boil it down right now to what a geometric mean is, right? A geometric mean is simply a number whose product with itself will be equal to the product of the two numbers that you're finding the mean of. Now think about that compared to an arithmetic mean of two numbers, right? When I add two numbers and divide by two, I get a number that when I add it to itself would give me the sum of the two numbers I started with, right? On the other hand, when I find a geometric mean, I'm finding a number whose product with itself would give me the same product of the two numbers that I'm finding the geometric mean of. All right, so that's like a good way to think about what the geometric mean is as opposed to our more kind of normal mean, which is technically called the arithmetic mean. All right, let's keep going. Let's see where else it comes up in geometry and specifically something that we've seen before in this course. Exercise number three. In the diagram below, points D and E lie on segment AB and segment AC such that segment DE is parallel to segment BC. If AD is equal to 5, EC is equal to 20, and AE is equal to DB, letter A, find the length of AE. All right, great. Now, we've seen before something in our course called the side splitter theorem. And the side splitter theorem says that if I draw a line in a triangle, parallel to one of the sides of the triangle, then it divides the other two sides proportionally, all right? So I'm gonna write this down real quick. I want you to know the name of this theorem primarily because I love the name of it. The sp side splitter theorem, right? And the side splitter theorem literally says if we take AD and we divide it by DB, we're gonna get the same thing as if I take AE and I divide it by EC. So before we actually set up the equation and solve it and whatnot, again, the side splitter theorem says, if this is parallel to this, then when I do this segment divided by this segment, I'll get the same as this segment divided by that segment, okay? And now it's pretty easy, right? I'm gonna get five divided by x is equal to x divided by 20. When I solve this, I'm gonna cross multiply and I'm gonna get x squared is equal to 100, right? And then I'll take the square root of both sides and I'll get x equals 10. So in this case, right, just to make sure you see the connection to what we're doing, right, I'm getting, right, x to be the square root of five times 20. So in this case, this particular thing that I'm solving for is the geometric mean of these two segments that I know, all right? Now let's just kind of verify that the side splitter theorem worked. Let's take a look at letter B. Does your answer make sense in terms of the side splitter theorem? Explain. All right, well, let me just bring this up for a second. And now I'm gonna like just kind of scratch out that X and put a 10 there and put a 10 there because that's what we figured out our answers were. And now you should really be able to see that, that proportionality that the side splitter theorem is really getting at, right? Five divided by 10 is one half and 10 divided by 20 is one half. So that is what the side splitter theorem tells us. That parallel lines will split sides in triangles proportionally. Right, so the answer is yes. The 
parallel line split the sides. Whoops. Proportionally. All right. And this really kind of gets us to something or another way of defining a geometric mean, right? So let's take a look at the geometric mean of two numbers as a solution. The geometric mean of the numbers m and n is the positive solution to the equation m divided by x equals x divided by n. All right, and again, it's really cool. Like, think about this for a second. We had these three numbers, 5, 10, and 20, right? With 10 being the geometric mean of these two numbers, all right? So what geometric means really are is it's kind of cool, right? 10 divided by 5 is 2, and 20 divided by 10 is 2. So the geometric mean of, the, of two numbers, any two numbers, is that unique number in between them that when you do the ratio of that geometric mean to the first number, you get the same answer as the second number's ratio to the geometric mean, right? The ratio of the first number to the geometric mean is equal to the ratio of the geometric mean to the second number, all right? And again, it's this kind of cool like difference between an arithmetic mean where you add two numbers and divide by two versus a geometric mean when you multiply two numbers and find the square root. All right, now let's see how it connects to something that we did in our last lesson. Geometric means arise in the previous problems that we saw regarding the altitude drawn to the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Remember how very kind of complicated these problems were. Let's take a look at exercise number four to refresh our memory. Given right triangle QRS shown below with altitude QT partitioning hypotenuse RS into segments with the lengths given. Letter A, sketch the two smaller right triangles below in the same orientation. All right, awesome. So right now, right, I've, remember how this works, I've got three right triangles, our largest one, and then the two others that are created when I drop the altitude from the right angle down to the hypotenuse, okay? And to see the similarity of the three right triangles, it's always very helpful to have all three of them drawn in the same orientation. Now, I like to do the following before I even do that. I like to mark off my congruent angles on my diagram to help me draw them easier. So I'm gonna mark that particular angle with one slash, this one with a double, which means this has got to be a double and that's got to be a single. Okay, now letter A just says, asks me to sketch the two smaller right triangles in the same orientation, but I think what I'm going to do is literally sketch them in the same orientation as the large right triangle, which means that they're sort of lying on their hypotenuse. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that smaller one. Okay, so my smaller right triangle, okay, with its right angle here, and T, let me throw that right angle right like that. And then I've got S down here with its single dash mark and Q up here with its double. And now I'm also gonna label all of those various lengths. So that's A, that's D, that's H. That way we can refer to those lengths without having to refer to like all of the QT, ST, et cetera. Now I wanna do my sort of medium sized right triangle, if you will, in the same orientation. So I'll kind of draw it like that. And again, the T is up here. The Q is down here. The R is here. All right, all right. my hypotenuse this time is B. This is H and this is E. Okay, so I've got those two smaller right triangles that are similar to each other drawn in the same orientation. Now let's take a look at letter B. Using the similarity of the two triangles from A, show that the length of the altitude H is the geometric mean of the lengths of the two partitioned segments of the hypotenuse RS, D, and E. Whew, that was wordy. But let me just make sure that we got that without having to kind of go through all this. What I'm going to try to prove right now is that in every situation like this, the length of that altitude H, right, is actually the geometric mean of simply the D and the E. It's the geometric mean of the two partitioned lengths of the hypotenuse. All right, 
well, watch how I can do this, right? I'm gonna use similarity of right triangles and I'm just gonna use the two legs on each one. So I'm gonna say that ST divided by QT, right? So ST divided by QT is gonna be equal to QT divided by RT. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw in all those kind of A's, B's, C's, D's, E's, and F's and whatnot, right? So ST is my D, QT is my H, the length of that altitude, QT is again H, and RT is equal to E. And even at this point, before we go ahead and solve it or do anything like this, this is enough to know that the, the length of that altitude, H, is equal to the geometric mean of D and E, the two partitioned segments of the hypotenuse. We can then go ahead and rearrange this. We could write it then as H squared is equal to D times E. And we can even take it so far as to say H is equal to the square root of D times E. All right, any of these three are enough to show that it is the geometric mean. And again, think about how easy that would then make it if we knew the two partition lengths of the hypotenuse to find the length of the altitude. I just need to find their product and take the square root. All right, which also means, by the way, that H has to be somewhere in between these two, right? Because the geometric mean will always lie in between the two numbers that you are finding the mean of. The only way that's not true is if the two numbers you're finding the mean of happen to be the same number in which case the geometric mean just is that number. All right, let's take a look now at letter C. Draw the smaller right triangle in the same orientation as the, law, as the original right triangle. Well, we've already done this once, but let's do it again. All right, I've got my larger right triangle here. I'm gonna throw these things back on just so I've got them. Okay, and all I want now is my smaller right triangle which we've done already. That doesn't look like a right angle, but you know, bear with me. All right, I've got T, um, S, and Q. All right, and I've got my A, my H, and my D. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Again, sorry about the absolutely horrible looking right angle that clearly is not drawn to scale. All right, but I've got it. Now let's take a look at letter D. Show that the length of QS is the geometric mean of the length of SR and ST. So again, let, let's talk about this before we kind of set up the equations and cross multiply and everything here. What we're trying to prove now is that the length of QS, which is that leg length, A, that's actually the geometric mean of SR, the large hypotenuse, and ST, that portion of the hypotenuse that's adjacent to the leg itself, okay? So I just wanna prove that that's true, okay? Now I don't really care about this H at all, so I'm working with my D, my A, my A, and my C, okay? So I can now say that ST divided by QS, or maybe I'll do QS divided by ST, it doesn't really matter, all right? So I'm doing QS divided by ST is equal to SR divided by QS. Just using similarity again, okay? So in other words, QS divided by ST is equal to SR divided by QS. Now I can fill in all of my letters, right? My QS is my A, my ST is D, SR is C, and QS is again A, cross multiply. I get A squared is equal to D times C. Again, that's enough to really know that it's the geometric mean, but I can also say that A is the square root of D times C. All right. Now, side note, we could have done exactly the same thing with the medium-sized triangle, and what we would have found in that case is that the length of B is the geometric mean of this large hypotenuse again with C, right, 
down here, or not C, I'm sorry, E down here. Couldn't read the screen from here. Um, again, the idea being that the one of the legs of the original right triangle is simply the geometric mean of the hypotenuse of the original right triangle with the segment of the hypotenuse that's adjacent to the leg that we're trying to find. Very wordy. But let's summarize these. All right. Geometric means and right triangles. The altitude to the hypotenuse of the right triangle has a length that is the geometric mean of the two segment lengths partitioned along the hypotenuse, and that is the most common. The length of, the, of either leg of the original right triangle is the geometric mean of the length of the hypotenuse with the length of the partition segment of the hypotenuse adjacent to the leg. All right, so let, let's kind of take a look at these sort of with our diagram. All right, case one was the first one that we looked at, and it's really this simple. The length of that altitude will always be the geometric mean of the two partition segments of the hypotenuse. In other words, D over H equals H over E, or H squared equals D times E, or H is just the square root of D times E. Case two is if we're trying to think about either A or B, the two legs of the original right triangle. In either case, those two legs are the geometric mean of the entire hypotenuse with whichever segment of the hypotenuse is adjacent or touching the two legs. So in other words, A will be the square root of C times D, and B will be the square root of C times E. Okay, and that makes finding or solving these problems that involve these kind of triangles exceptionally easy. Let's take a look at the next problem. Exercise number five. Given right triangle EFG, altitude FH is drawn to hypotenuse EG, partitioning it into lengths of four and 16. Determine the length of altitude FH. Okay, so the first thing that I'm looking for is simply FH. But what we just saw was that FH is the geometric mean of EH and HG. So you can do it as simple as this. FH is the square root of EH times HG. So FH is the square root of 4 times 16, which is the square root of 64, which is equal to 8. And again, look at this for a second, right? Right? 8 divided by 4 is 2, and 16 divided by 8 is 2, right? 8 is twice 4, 16 is twice 8. That's really easy to do when all the numbers are kind of nice like this. It's harder when they get a little bit more complicated, which we'll see in letter B. Determine the length of side EF in simplest radical form. Now, most students have a real easy time with this first theorem, the idea that the altitude is just simply the geometric mean of those two segments. When we're trying to figure out one of the two legs, that becomes a little bit trickier. Again, the idea here is that EF all right, will be the geometric mean of EH and EG. All right, so in other words, right, EF is the geometric mean of the segment of the hypotenuse that it's adjacent to and the entire hypotenuse. Now this one's going to get a little bit uglier, right? Because what we have now is EF is equal to the square root of 4 times not 16, but 20 now, which is going to be the square root of 80. The largest perfect square that goes into 80 is 16 and it goes in there five times, and therefore we get four root five. All right. Now that one's a lot harder to kind of think about in terms of, oh, four is to four root five as four root five is to 20. That's a little bit more complicated than, oh yeah, four divided by eight is equal to eight divided by 16. But you could work out all the, the math. It would just involve ugly square roots. All right, let's wrap this up. So we introduced a brand new term today, a geometric mean of two numbers, right? This idea that there are different means out there other than just adding two numbers and dividing by two, right? And the geometric mean is multiplying two numbers and then finding the square root.
Now, the most important consequence of that that we came out with today were those two theorems right at the end, the idea that the altitude drawn to the hypotenuse of a right triangle is the geometric mean of the two segments of the hypotenuse, and either leg of the original right triangle is the geometric mean of the hypotenuse of the original right triangle with the segment of the right triangle that's adjacent to the leg that we're trying to figure out. All right, and again, that one's a little bit harder to say than, than, the, than the original one. These are gonna become very important in our next lesson when we prove the Pythagorean theorem. For now, I just wanna thank you for joining me for another geometry lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.